Hello, I'm Omar Moore, the Popcorn Reel on Twitter, the Popcorn R-E-E-L. That's my Twitter handle, and the website is popcornreel.com. Welcome to this feature-length audio commentary for the 1967 film The Incident. Larry Pierce directed this film. His last name is spelled P-E-R-C-E. And it's a film that is unusual in terms of its look because in 1967, you really didn't have films shot in black and white. It was much more an anomaly. But this stripped down, stark looking visage that we see of these men and of this whole movie is perfectly styled because it exposes something really raw and deep. That's Tony Masanti right there, who is acting defiantly against this really kind of freaked out pool manager, owns this pool hall. He, he doesn't look very comfortable. Tony Musanti, I mean, he was really good uh, in this film. If you've seen this film, I hope you have at this point. Um, Martin Sheen makes his big screen debut here, by the way. And the camera just lingers on them as they walk and then walk out of this pool hall and all they are doing is laughing. These are, these are guys who are drinking and skylarking around and it's interesting the way they're dressed as well in suits um, and they are looking around on this empty street in New York City which is where this film takes place. I'm going to talk about the title of the incident later on because it is deliberately titled in a very open-ended way. I think one of the things you should ask yourself when you're watching this film is to ask which incident. So this film comes along at a time where there was a period in Hollywood where for about, I guess, 15 years or so, if not more, was a period of intensive, intense misogyny. I mean, misogyny has been on this planet from day one and certainly has been in movies well before 1967. But there was an era in the 1960s, and I guess it went up until maybe the late 1970s, certainly through the mid-1970s in Hollywood films where there was a distinct and brutal misogyny. The patriarchy seemed to really fight back, not that it was under any attack in the first place. It certainly has been here for a long time as well because that's what breeds the misogyny. But as you see these men stumbling through the empty streets of, of New York City, uh, Perhaps it's Queens that they're in here um, as they look for trouble. This movie came along at a time where there was so much misogyny in movies, in Hollywood, in American films in particular in Hollywood for many years, but particularly in the 1960s. This is an era of films like Straw Dogs, which came out in 1971, Chinatown, which came out the same year, then A Clockwork Orange, which came out the same year. There were a number of these films, and those are all early 1970s, 1971. This one preceded it by four years, and there were others that I am blanking on at this moment, but hopefully I'll remember them before this commentary is done. But this film was different from those other ones because while those other films also had some social commentary, particularly a film like Straw Dogs, which is rather disturbing, Sam Peckinpah's film, which really was flat out saying in one of its key scenes that 
a woman likes to be raped. I mean, that is the the outrageous and so disingenuous and evil subject that I that's that's what I got from Straw Dogs among many other things but that was the disturbing moment and the dishonest moment when Susan George is lying there with a smile on her face um, after what happens to her I mean these men this man clearly has raped her and she somehow has this smile on her face that really is you know this male invention and so this movie too the incident is a male invention is directed by a male it's about males and quite quite frankly it's about toxic males and toxic toxic masculinity but it's also about a couple of other things and i'm going to just develop and explain what those themes are that are running through this movie It's also about lies as well, and, and the lies and the truth of, of who we are as human beings, and that's a starter for 10 for you, as it were. And we are seeing predators, but we're also seeing people in this scene who are very scared, even as they are predators. They are really frightened people, and the camera work here gives us an idea of the lies and the truth. Martin Sheen in the close-up and Tony Musanti in the background. The, the foreground, this kind of uh, diopter, biopter shot where you've got Sheen in the foreground and in the background Musanti is telling us something about the truth of the character played by Martin Sheen is that he acts as if he's this male terrorist and he is, but there's something else going on in him. He's playing a role. And that is very evident to me. And we'll see a bit more of that role play later on in a really um, powerful and duplicitous scene. Tony Masanti. in the background of the scene and here he grabs this man Masanti is just excellent in this movie you see what they're doing here they are mugging this older man and very clearly are on the verge of killing him um, and there's the lie, right? They've, they've, they've been disappointed now because they only find $8 in this man's pocket. And he explains to them that he's a poor man. It's 1967. You're dealing with a film that takes place in a very critical time in the United States. You have had um, a climate against the war in Vietnam start to really brew up and you've just had um, a lot of upheaval socially. Um, you've had uh, a lot of uprising and there's more to come, of course, after 1967. This shot from the victim's point of view for a brief moment there. There's a lot of reveals in Larry Pierce's movie and he gives us an unblinking look at the evils of toxic masculinity and also the lies and the truth, right? The truth and the lies. And the lie is that, that this guy's going to get away with being only mugged. And what we're just seeing there is a brutal murder. He's now murdered this guy. And that's the Martin Sheen doing that. And I contend to you that as, as savage as that beating was, and I think he's killed him, that's my interpretation. 
as savage as that beating was, I think it was Martin Sheen role playing. The character that Martin Sheen plays is role playing for Tony Musanti. He's performing for him. He is performing what I call a masculinity test. Now it's a, a toxic masculinity test, but it is a test nonetheless. And so far, Martin Sheen's character is passing it with flying colors. Opening credit title, the incident. And these two men are the only people on the street. And then you see this subway car, this subway train, New York City subway train. By the way, um, Larry Pierce was not given permission to shoot the New York City subway when they found out about the subject matter of this movie. And so um, they actually stole these shots that you're seeing right here of the train. Note that cast. It's an incredible cast of people. Ed McMahon, for goodness sake. Ruby Dee and Brock Peters. Wow, there you go. And there we go. Introducing Tony Musanti and Martin Sheen. Uh, and both of them, and this, you know, is their big screen, both of them big screen debuts. You don't think Masanti was in anything. I know Martin Sheen wasn't, to the best of my knowledge. Of course, the subway we will see, and the subway car we will soon see, becomes the biggest character in the incident. And there are very good reasons for that. But there is something else that's going on in this film that's deeper than the subway train. And I talked about some of the films that were really harrowing and misogynistic in this time period. And another of them, also again in the 1970s, early 1970s, was The Taking of Pelham 123, which is a film that also takes place largely in the subway, particularly on a subway train um, for pretty much the whole entire film. There is nothing like the New York City subway. I mean, yes, Chicago has the L, and that is a character of its own as well, but the New York City subway is the thing. I don't think there are any movies that have been shot in a different subway system more often than in the New York City subway system. And I'm talking about on the entire planet. That's Ed McMahon there uh, with Diana Van der Vlees. The two of them married. They have just come from some kind of function and their child is obviously sleeping. And as you see here, Diana Van der Vlees flags a cab. But there's this class issue, right, that's going on. And Ed McMahon's saying, hey, look, you know, we can't afford this cab. I don't want to pay for this cab at this time of night. You know, it's going to cost us a fortune. Now, the character's name is Helen, and she has just looked at this cab go by, and she's incredulous. You know, she cannot believe that Ed McMahon would do that. You know, that her husband would put her in that kind of jeopardy and put their child in that jeopardy. Another shot of the subway there from a distance. And, and again, it's this theme that's going on, this toxic masculinity. And you see this couple here. And we've already had the establishment of it in that last scene with... Diana van der Vliss and Ed McMahon. How Ed McMahon completely sacrifices the safety of his wife and himself, quite frankly, as well as their child. And he's more concerned about the money and the budget that's going to come out of his pocket. Now, bear in mind, this is all taking place at 2 a.m. in the morning. So everything you have seen up till this point is on a, presumably on a weekend night and on a weekend and it is 2 a.m. in the morning and Ed McMahon has just refused a taxi cab, which is counterintuitive, even if he claims that he is not a millionaire. 
what we're seeing here is quite frankly in my opinion a prelude to rape i mean this guy is out on a date with the woman that you have seen him forcing himself on i mean it's an attempted rape and she's doing everything to fend him off and he's look what he's doing And there's this interesting thing about this because after all of this, she's skipping along with him down the street. And see, this is where I talk about this male gaze, this very misogynistic gaze that I was saying that clearly occurred in a film like Straw Dogs because there's this notion on the part of some men, many men, and certainly some male film directors that somehow a woman enjoys the notion that a man would want to force himself on her. Clearly here, the director doesn't make that point bluntly, but in that scene you saw moments ago, it was clear that this woman was skipping down the street to get this train after this guy had forced himself on her. You've got this cynical older couple here. And that's Thelma Ritter, the great Thelma Ritter. And she climbs up the steps with her husband there. Um, and he's just had it. <laughs> you know, he's had it with with what he's doing. He's, um, I think he's been told to babysit his grandkids and he's just had enough of his son doing that to him and putting him in this position what position right how could you not like to be a grandparent i mean grandparent isn't that the easiest job on the planet <laughs> you know all of the joys but none of the direct responsibilities i know that's a cynical take but there is a lot of truth to that subway train again And this subway connects these people. We're seeing these different groups of people. There's Bo Bridges, by the way, with his arm in a sling. And his army buddy there at the table opposite him. Bo Bridges, my goodness me, it's so funny to see him. He looks literally like a, like a kid. And there he is, I mean. Oh, innocent golden boy, choir boy. Why? He wouldn't hurt a fly. Oh, well, this is what, seven years after Psycho. And there is something to this idea of the so-called pretty boy or the, the clean-cut white guy, I'll put it like that, who is cast in the movie as this really um, harmless figure, you know, until we kind of get an idea of the exact opposite. So this is the Mashulu Parkway. So um, my New York geography, and I used to live in New York, so I should know where this is. So I'm not going to embarrass myself by getting it wrong. <laughs> I'm going to leave it open here. Now, now this, the child is crying, and you can tell, you know, there's something nasty that Ed McMahon has just said to, and that his name is Bill in this movie. So Bill has just said something really nasty to Helen about children there's this male contempt that runs through and here helen wants to know what are you saying when you talk about kids like this because he has said that the child that he has in his arms right there their child is an accident was an accident and so she has absolutely had it with him you know it's as if he never wanted a child and he's really trying to find a way to talk about it with his wife. But he talks about it in such crude and hurtful ways that as a man, he just doesn't have, at least this particular man, I should say, does not have the emotional accessibility to tap into his feelings without hurting the woman that he supposedly loves. 
So they've entered this subway car now. They've seen this wino or this bum who is lying there. And he's a, a character all his own. I mean, that particular guy is, is probably the only person in this film who, well, as far as I can see, is, is quote unquote innocent, you know? Like I say, I hope by now you have watched this film. If you've not watched this film, I think you might want to do so and stop listening to the commentary here. Note those camera angles of the legs of this particular woman, the date, the two dates there, and it's all from the male perspective. It's this male misogynistic gaze. So you're shooting the camera at the woman's legs so you're suggesting a point of view, maybe not perhaps of the character, but it could be the character, but it might be your own point of view. It may be the audience's point of view. It is a very claustrophobic film. And I will say that maybe that's also the point. He is putting you right where this person is, this man is. And he's push, putting you, the audience, right there. So you are walking right behind this particular woman and therefore you are looking at her legs, or at least if you're a man, or, a, or particularly a straight man, you're probably going to be looking at her legs. Is that what Larry Pierce, the director, is telling us? So there's this moment here of vulnerability and cynicism and bitterness all rolled into one. The woman here is vulnerable. She's vulnerable. Um, this might be Donna Mills, I'm not 100%, but she's vulnerable. And this guy is trying to play this, oh, I've been hurt kind of angle. But he knows what he wants and he's manipulating this situation now. And he's angry, but he knows what he wants. He's trying to fight what he knows he wants. And this woman is, this particular woman is shining him on. It's a role that she's playing, but I think it's a role she's playing out of self-preservation, but it might be a role that she really wants. Maybe she really is turned on by this man. I don't know. I'd have to actually ask the actor who plays her. I believe it is Donna Mills. But I also think that this scene is played out of, again, a misogynistic backdrop this notion that a woman is accessible for a man's every whim and that somehow the woman is going to like it whenever it's on the man's terms, no matter what, you know? It may not be on her terms at all, but the point being made is that she's got to be ready at all at any time and that, of course, is very dangerous and untrue. And that is not the way it is or should be. That we know that in this society and all around the world, women are attacked violently every day, every day. And yes, it is rape. There's this um, moment in that last scene that I wanna to refer to right now before we get too far along, where that particular man has sat down there with the woman that he's been dating and they sit right in front of um, Diana van der Vliss and Ed McMahon, <laughs> right in front of him. And it's a relatively empty car at this stage. And of course you have no choice but to look at two people who are kissing each other right in front of you. And that's the claustrophobia of the movie. And then he says to Ed McMahon and Diana van der Vliss, what are you looking at? Well. But you're bringing the action right to them. What are they going to do? Turn away? Note the camera angles. Again, it's close-ups. We're seeing them kissing. It's all in our face. Somebody out there is going to shout, Get a room! The subway train again. And all of these buildings with the windows, and it evokes something. Yeah, I want to just give you another angle to think about, societal angle to think about here. 
This film came out in 1967. In 1961, there were the Milgram experiments, Stanley Milgram, a professor at Yale did these experiments where he would trick people who would be paid money to come in and pretend to, or not, they wouldn't pretend, pretend but they'd be paid to in, increase the voltage on somebody who was on the other side of a curtain. The person on the other side of the curtain was an actor. That actor pretended to be shocked. So every time that the person administering the experiment, Stanley Milgram, would tell the, uh, the person uh, who got paid money to be part of the experiment to turn up the voltage, and don't worry, it's my responsibility, you can turn up the voltage, don't worry, it's my fault, I'll get in trouble, you won't. And so that person would turn up the voltage and the actor would shout as if he or she were shocked. When in reality, there was no electric current that was shocking them. It was all an act. And the actor was able to see when the volume was being turned up um, and could detect that. And then the person would shout and pretend to be shocked which horrified the person who turned, of course, the actual lever to turn up the voltage. And then Milgram would keep telling them to turn up the voltage more and more. Those experiments were experiments to exercise authority and to make the point that authority is a powerful thing and that as long as you listened to authority and you were being assured that you would not be held accountable, liable, or responsible in any way, shape, or form, criminally or otherwise, you would keep turning up the volume on that voltage as long as someone was telling you, don't worry, keep turning it up, you're not gonna be responsible. That was a very powerful thing and that, those experiments lasted for, I believe, two years. And they were very successful and in basically eight out of 10 cases, or even more than that, the people who were turning up the voltage kept doing so and kept doing so only because the professor Milgram or whomever was administering the experiment was telling them it was okay to do so. This obedience to authority. So that was one part in 1961. Then in 1963, the other key component here the murder of Kitty Genovese in 1963 in Queens, New York. Late at night, around two in the morning, by the way. I believe it was on a Sunday morning or maybe during the midweek. And reputedly, a lot of people actually saw Kitty Genovese be raped and murdered. And I think only one or two of them called the police. So those two things are things that preceded, two events that preceded this movie. But they all do play a part. I'll explain. Notice that sign there, work with the mentally retarded. The pay is great. That is, a, that is another thing. That particular poster that's on the inside of that subway car, and we see Bo Bridges and his, his uh, army companion buddy there enter the train, they're sitting down. But that poster in that subway is also a character and I think it reveals a sense of menace and an attitude that percolates in the minds of I think not just these two people that you're going to see that we've seen to begin with but I think a lot of people in that car and that's what I think will come to be terrorizing and terrifying and disturbing. So we still see the two people there kissing. This lechery, it's like a, it's like lechery. It's these, you know, these things that are happening right in your face. And of course, the 1960s was the era of free love. So that's another thing that gets thrown in here. But this free love is not exactly consensual. It's very crude. The way it's being thrown at us. Then here is the claustrophobia of isolation and this um, man sitting at the bar who we just saw right here. 
you know, he looks like his world has been um, set alight here now. And he's now moving along to this man. And um, this is, uh, you know, this rejection and isolation. Uh, this is a gay man in 1967. And, and in America, being a gay man in 1967, um, was to be living in hell because a lot of American society and still today um, just is so homophobic and transphobic. And so he has to tread very lightly here, sadly but truly. He has to be very, very careful. And so he's looking for a male companion and he just doesn't catch a break here. And so again, there's this issue of masculinity going on, toxic versus passive. Um, there's issues of role play and about sexuality and isolation and stereotypes and gender roles. You've got a bartender saying to these two women, which one of you is gonna take me home tonight? And they all laugh and I guess they're a little drunk, but there's, you know, there's something there too that's going on. And then you've got this man who is trying uh, and he's drinking here and he can tell, you know, this, this, this drink and he just, he's gone. You know, he's just, he's just got to go. He can't. Um, this guy's had a lot of trouble with drink in his life and he, he just can't. He's just got to escape here. Um, so he's trying to, he's trying to, and it shows you, look at how claustrophobic. These bathrooms really were like this in the 1960s. This is no joke. They were really, look at how close they are. One guy is at the urinal and here's the guy who is, you know, the gentleman who is looking for male companionship. And he's literally basically in the lap of the guy urinating. It's look how close everything is. And look at the juxtaposition of bodies too. I find that interesting. He's bent over and the guy who is the gay man is standing there and it looks as if really he's actually rear ending him. Um, and I don't know, again, if that's the director's um, way of making a statement or if I'm reading something into that or if that's just coincidental. But the overarching point of that scene is the claustrophobia and how people are on top of each other in a city like New York, which, of course, there are, what, at the moment, nine and a half million stories. And here again, look, another woman's legs that we see. And she's walking on the edge of that subway platform. And here's her bespectacled, bespe <laughs> bespectacled, I can't even say it, bespectacled husband. Nothing, that's the trouble. She's, she's discontent. And the film is presenting her as this, I think, sexually dissatisfied person. She just is really dissatisfied with her husband. And he looks like this preening, ineffectual, frankly effeminate priss, if you will. He looks like an, I wouldn't say he's closeted at all. I would say he's just inadequate. And she is showing you this sex appeal. She's crossing her legs. And this is Jan Sterling, who by the way, I think um, is very good in this film the body language and the the contempt she has. She's measuring him up, her own husband, to one of the people that we saw, and I didn't talk about it, at the socialite party they were attending. And she's basically, I don't want to say, is she emasculating him? Uh, or is she just telling the truth about him? The truth and the lie. You know, that's the theme, the truth and the lie. She's comparing bank accounts like she could be telling the two of them, Jerry, this guy who is at the 
party they went to who's making all this money and her husband it suggests as well she could be telling them to both pull their penises out you know and see which one's bigger i mean that's when she's talking about his bank account well jerry makes all this money what i think she's really doing as a woman who i think is sexually dissatisfied or unsatisfied is basically saying he's got a bigger dick than you do I don't think she's emasculating him for the record. I know that some men might say that. Some women might say that. Some people might say that watching this scene. But I think she's had enough. I just think she's had enough of inadequate husband and she, um, that really rang home to her after she was at this party and she's just letting him have it. There's a lot of contempt. I mean, there's contempt um, from men and contempt from women in this movie. He should pay us a visit some night. I mean, that's like, talk about an invitation for a menage a trois or a cuckolding. I mean, she's basically telling him, when, when she says she should pay, pay us, he should pay us a visit some night. Well, I, I think she's basically saying to him, look, you know, he can be the, the bull here, you know, and you can be the cuckold. <laughs> and that might be their relationship. We don't know that based on this movie. It is the swinging 60s after all. This subway car is so well lit. It's almost too well lit. It's a circus of lights there above you. And she's still, Chan Sterling's got this contempt. And of course, all they've been doing is absolutely waylaying it. Tongue and everything. They've absolutely gone into it. They don't care who watches them. And now everybody has stopped saying, even with their eyes, get a room. They've stopped saying that now. And now they're just part of the landscape, you know. They're used to seeing them. I mean, they could all, the, the two of them could literally take their clothes off and literally start to have sex right there in that car. And I think such is now, um, at least when now meaning the movie stage of now in 67, nobody would have blinked an eye. I think that when I look at a film like this and it's so well shot, um, this police officer kind of moves in the background there while um, this guy who's been trying to resist alcohol, but uh, I think is failing big time. Um, you know, he's trying to reestablish his life and put himself in some kind of reordering so that he can move through life better because he says he hasn't had a drop of alcohol for eight months but eh, he's lying there's the truth and the lie and look he closes his eyes right because he's lying he had a, a drink right he had one and now here's the isolated man who is um, running up these steps See, he's lost everything, right? He's lost his wife, he's lost his family, and he's desperate. So all of these backstories are all being set up by Larry Pierce and by the gentleman who wrote this movie, a Christian so-and-so and somebody. Sorry, I did not remember his name. Whomever it was who wrote the screenplay did a very damn good job. And, and this guy's begging for his life Alcohol has destroyed his life, has destroyed everything. He's lost everything. He's begging for a life. He's begging for his own life, really. And here is this guy again. All he's searching for is love and male companionship. He wants that in 1967 and, and he's isolated. And it's the claustrophobia. He moves on right on him. You know, he's very... Uh, aggressive in a subtle way but he's aggressive he's come up he's snuck up on this guy you really do feel sorry at least I do I feel really sorry for this guy because again he all he wants is love and that's no crime now of course in 1967 he couldn't get to marry a man 
from 2015, June of that year, you are able to do that in the United States. And so if this movie was set in 2015, or at least after 2015, you would have seen the dynamic perhaps be a little bit different or maybe not. Maybe it's just about this man who's lonely. Um, but he definitely desires male company. And you can tell he's, he's pulsing with desire. He is desperate. He has desires. He's someone who... He's someone who really needs to be fed. And look, he's... Look at, the, look at that shot. Again, this trapping of this man. He's trapped. Look at this. Again, it's right in our face. He's struggling with the door. The door won't open. Here's this guy. He's kind of like, oh boy, I'm stuck with him. You know that feeling you get when someone you think is following you and they happen to, you hope that they move to a different subway car, but no, they sit in your car or they go through a door that does open to the next car and then they plunk down and sit right near you or opposite you and you can't get away from them um, at least until the next stop or unless the doors to the next car open but you don't want to be so obvious about it otherwise then they follow you again and you may have an issue here's another dynamic in the setup and i love the way that larry um, sets up the Larry Pierce sets up this, these vignettes that happen before everybody combines in that subway car. Ruby D and Brock Peters, there we go, two legends right there. And this is in the era, another social point, but also a film point, of 1967. 1967, this film came out the same year as both Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and In the Heat of the Night, both of which stars Sidney Poitier. And Brock Peters here, um, you know, again, you're dealing with race and, and racism and, and white people who um, are profoundly disrespectful and racist toward black people. Here's that scene. He, you know, this white conductor ticket agent has pushed this money or these, this token through. He shoved it through so hard it went on the floor. And Ruby D's character picks it up, you know. And Brock Peters there is really upset at her because this white man completely disrespected um, the black man there, played by Brock Peters. And Ruby D acquiesces to the disrespect by picking up the token. And that makes Brock Peters' character really upset. And so he's just angry now. And he's just really someone who's not taken any mess from a white person. And, and he certainly makes that clear uh, later on as well. But Brock Peters is furious that, quite frankly, at Ruby D. And again, it's this acquiescence, this dynamic between men and women. And it's this toxic masculinity as well, because even Brock Peters as well engages in it. Um, but this compliance to patriarchy as well, that I think some of the women in this film do. And I think in a way, Ruby D. and I... God rest her soul. And gosh, I was so fortunate to meet her and her late husband too when they were alive years ago. Um, in this film, Ruby D, who is outstanding in the movie, as is Brock Peters, as is, you know, I mean, the cast is really good. But they are outstanding and, and she pacifies Brock Peters and she's doing a good thing in a way because in a racist society in 1967, Brock Peters could be killed the character and he's just he's had it mount eden avenue is where they are and yeah he's just had it he's had it he just has had it with a uh, toxic white racist system that has institutionalized racism against him and ruby d and everybody who looks like them every black person and he has just had it you know you know,
And he's just contempt of the city. He just airs it. I told you how contempt is something that both men and women air in this movie. And I've shown you, or at least described to you examples. This one here is another one. You know, the contempt that Brock Peters character has for the system and what it does, the oppression and the oppressive system that keeps black people down and, and discriminates against them and, and um, violates them, quite frankly. And he's just railed against the system that says, wait your turn, don't worry. And he's just letting Ruby D have it. Ruby D's character is not having it though, because she expresses a more optimistic tone and says that change uh, takes time, it's gradual, but Brock Peters does not want to hear it. And you see that here, the expressions on their faces and the camera again, up front, the gulf between them, the isolation even, even though they're a couple, right? There's an isolation even in their relationship. And look at that gulf there between them. It's a really good camera angle. And she tries to bridge it here. She does, she gets closer to him. And he's talking about violence now. And now again, look, boom, camera right up in your face. The space between them has been halved. And it's again, this attempt to heal or at least arrest any kind of machination that Brock Peter's character is on about. And then here comes that subway train again. It's like an anthem, it's like a Greek chorus. This is a great shot here, of the two of them. And again, he's, Brock Peters just marched into this train and he sits down and these two servicemen, Bo Bridges and the other guy, they move over. <laughs> There's your white man for you and they look at the camera of this bum. He could have been black, honey, just as well. Yeah, but he ain't. <laughs> Brock Peters is like, yeah, but he ain't black, so there. You know, it's like, but he's pointing to something about the system failing these white men. And I think there is something to that. You know, this wino is drunk, you know, there's your white man. You know, he's, he's, you know, this idea of this abject failure of white men, even though they are in a system that absolutely benefits them, gives them privilege, gives them power, gives them everything. And they still fail, and they fail upward, or in this wino's case, fails on the uh, floor of the New York City subway car, or a seat of one, whichever, um, whichever comes first. They are at each other's throats, right? The point is, is that before we see um, these two terrorists who we've seen the first few minutes, everybody in this car is at each other's throats literally and figuratively like we're seeing here with the amorous dates i think that might be their first date and she's totally into it look at this nobody's even paying them attention now but here we are we've got these two and they look like kids here these are the two guys one of whom martin sheen has i think beaten his old man to death and now here they are and look at this, it's this very childish, juvenile masculinity, but it's extremely toxic. And the florist sign, I love that. This kind of um, clashing between this idea of masculinity that's toxic and maybe something that's a bit more open and empathetic and maybe feminine, florists. I mean, I know that's a stereotype of gender, but I do think that there are things that are being shot here that have an affectation that means something. And that's what great cinema does. It conjures up some meaning and imagery. Look at that shot. And boom, rudely into the tranquility of that shot are these two kids. These guys are not men, they're boys. And the camera sends us dizzy too. It's a really powerful, uh, great bit of cinematography. This is the whole movie. It's really excellent. Very well shot. Look at the way that camera twirls around like that. God, that's so dizzying. And we're clearly in the point of view of these two now. 
and they're I mean this is now they've stopped kissing he noticed that 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 was the incident that <laughs> stopped them you know and so now everybody you know has got you know they've now got the rapt attention of everybody in this car and they allowed these two white male terrorists you know they they're ter i mean they are they're gonna violate look at this work with the mentally retarded the pay is great and there it is again that that is a, a recurring character and that was the day when the word retarded was used openly you know now you will never see another poster anywhere on any subway or any website or anything else where the word retarded is used in conjunction with mental illness or, or people with mental challenges um, it's just not going to ever happen again in american society but that poster is very telling i don't know if the poster is editorializing its own contempt and the director's contempt or whether it reflects the mindset of these two people whether it is making a point about them being demented creatures or it could be making any point by the way it could be anything or it could just be a movie but it could be a subway poster for a movie but come on <laughs> in a, in any movie nothing is there by accident sometimes there are there are happy accidents in cinema but um yeah come on a lot of the time i'd say at 99 percent of the time things are deliberate and sometimes the happy accidents arise out of that deliberateness. This is the savagery of these people, right? Why can't they leave him alone? And that's what Jan Sterling says. And, you know, this is Martin Sheen setting this guy's foot on fire. And look at that. They're all sitting there watching. And look, what are they doing? Oh, he's just a bum. It's nothing, you know. So... The thing is, is it's kind of this Nemoa thing. Well, he's a bum, so I'm not going to advocate on his behalf. First, they came for the bums, but I wasn't a bum. And I said nothing. Then they came for this group, but I wasn't that group. And I said, no, you get the idea. Now, this guy is the only person so far who's spoken up. And so he makes an intervention. And, you know, he's not afraid to do so. I love that shot of the reflection of the two military uh, men there in the glass that you just briefly saw over the shoulder of the man challenging these two terrorist thugs. And you see it shot there again. See that? It's interesting because there's a bit of clarity here this man could get hurt now that's this is the guy who lied just now talking about truth and lies he lied a moment ago when he was on the phone saying i want my wife back i want my family back i haven't had a drink in eight months he clearly has had a drink and now there's this kind of truth serum about him and he's unafraid to challenge these people who are very dangerous people now people are concerned they're concerned because these two terroristic thugs are not going to go away now it's interesting because every time the train stops you think there's going to be a respite but not so much tony masanti is so wickedly good here it's just so good and I don't know that he's supposed to be this good, but he is. I mean, I think what makes this film watchable uh, is the acting. The acting is so good. And there's no such thing as dead man's twitch. It's dead man's switch, which is what is used in subway cars to um, stop and trip out the train should something happen to the driver. God forbid he gets, he or she gets shot you know shot and killed or something like that there's a switch that's supposed to automatically lock and come on within a certain amount of time that stops the train from running completely you know off the rails or completely you know into real trouble 
and endangering the lives of you know dozens and hundreds of passengers and they're kind of making this play on that dead man's twitch and it's really dead man's switch they're all sitting there and look at Brock Peters he's got this smile on his face it's a perverse smile he's getting great pleasure by the way out of watching this white man being terrorized by two other white men Now, they're being asked if he's a friend of theirs, and everybody in that car says, no, he's not. And the thing is, any one of them could have told a lie and said, yeah, he is my friend. They all could have had that I am Spartacus moment. Of course, that movie came out, um, I think, before. I think that movie came out in 1963, Spartacus. But all of these people or whenever the movie came out. But all of these people had their moment. Then it came out a little bit earlier than 63. But all these people had, it could have been 59. But all these people have a moment to say, hey, look, you know, this guy is my friend. They all could have said it, but they don't. They all tell the truth. Now, this is the scene I want to draw some attention to, that I talk about role-playing, and I talk about Martin Sheen, and maybe that the Martin Sheen character, the terrorist, is a role player rather than an actual I mean he's a terrorist but he's somebody who I think is playing a role uh, for Tony Masanti look at this scene this is an extraordinary scene here and by the way Sheen's character's name is Artie I think there's something here about Artie too um there could be this genuine truth about Artie. Perhaps Artie is, is gay. I don't know. Maybe he's gay. Maybe he's straight. Maybe he's curious. Maybe he's bi-curious. I don't know. But this scene plays out in such a wonderful way, actually. A beautiful way. But it's also very duplicitous, as we're going to see. Is he lying here when he says he's in serious trouble? Is Artie lying or is he telling the truth? Is this a ruse or is this real? Is this a trap or is this something more profound than that? There's this longing that's being expressed and I don't know if both the Tony Masanti and Martin Sheen characters are gay or not. I don't know. I don't know. And as I say, in, in 1960s America to Talk about being a gay person is something that was not the done thing. There were people who came out of the closet in the 60s, but to so, so to speak, but they were not necessarily advertising who they were. And there's a big difference, I think, to a degree, I'd say. I'm just going to play. Play along with me. Could you do that? This is what Martin Sheen is saying to this man who uh, is a gay man and who is looking for companionship and, and really looking for love and looking for someone to uh, just just you know put an arm around if, if nothing else and this is the role play is this the role play or is this the truth and now he's attacking this gay man and he's saying all these anti-gay things to him and homophobic things you know, this is, I don't know. I mean, this looks like a trick to me. Oh, they got hold of a queer, he says. So in other words, again, it's this kind of, oh, well, it's not me. I don't care about gay people. I don't care. And he, and he uses the word queer. I don't care about gay people. I don't care about bums. So I'm not going to fight back. Again, it's that whole Nimona, Pasta Nimolo. You know, first they came for the 
black people first they came you know then they came for Jewish people then I didn't speak out and then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me you know that's the whole Pastor Niemola poem right and we're seeing a bit of that here where people are not standing up and it's part of the experiment it's, the, it's like the Milgram experiment it's like the Kitty Genovese case where you know people were very hesitant it's part of what's called the bystander theory where the more people there are in a group the less likely someone in that group will act if they see something as an you know something of an, of an atrocity happening in front of them but the less people there are in a group the more likely somebody in that group will act because they'll be compelled to if there's only three people in a group and they see something in front of them that's traumatic or, or violent the chances of them intervening are greater in fact if you don't believe me about that study anything study in fact just what four years ago or so and at least at the time i'm recording this so i've just dated it but look back to 2017 where um, there was a violent attack on two white men on a portland oregon train uh, those two men were intervening on behalf of a black two black women young black girls like young black women they were 20 or so or whatever and one of them was muslim and so there was a white man who was attacking and being verbally abusive to them and it was a small crowd a train it wasn't very crowded and these two white men confronted him and he killed both of them with a i guess a razor or a knife but the point is is that the bystander theory was broken there because these two men actually acted to stop this man from terrorizing these two black uh, young women don't let it bother you oh they're just playing oh this ain't my town it doesn't bother me so you know this part isn't my town either so they are absolutely attacking this gay man and those two military guys are like oh no problem i'm not bothered this ain't my town i've got no duty to act here to stop this i'm just going to sit here and watch and you can see the horror on Brock Peters' face there on the left as these two guys are, are just attacking this guy, ridiculing him for being gay, attacking him. Frankly, they're molesting him, it looks like. I mean, my goodness. And he's begging for help. And Brock Peters says, no, I'm not interested. Even that guy has an amused look on his face there. And you see um, Jan Sterling there kind of nonplussed, but not saying anything get down buddy that's the only guy that really offers any kind of resistance but the rest of them are quite happy to see this going on their own anti-gay bigotry you know this guy is totally getting off on this now it's a really creepy moment because he's feeling him he's actually feeling him and you can't see that on camera there but you can infer it that he's actually been feeling him and that he's actually quite frankly i think ejaculated in his pants and the camera just holds on him look at him he totally has got i mean and look he's and look at that he's absolutely humiliated him right and i think it's really discreet how it's shot but it's really powerful because you can infer that this man this gay man here that we are now right up against the claustrophobia of this he is absolutely you know ejaculated here as a result of what this guy is doing and what tony masanti did to him and you can see it he's like he's the way his face looks he's been humiliated he is absolutely you know he's gotten aroused and he's got off on it and he's really been humiliated here and violated quite frankly as well even if the guy has had an orgasmic release of some kind i mean i'm just inferring that based on the way this is being shot uh, and it's humiliating and of course in this year say in any year now i'm sure there'd be the obligatory shot of his pants right being wet so that you can see that he's got off on it but this here now is it's a hate crime this is an absolute attack on a man um literally the man is being attacked 
and look at it it's just evil and now finally we see some people standing up this older couple you can tell he's completely going to sleep there and there's that train again it's a really uneasy uncomfortable moment because this guy has clearly got what he's wanted what he's been craving for what we've seen on his face for the better part of this you know this movie you know it's been what an hour or so in and he's finally got his release but look how he gets it right in a way that he doesn't want it's this humiliation of him by these two men and it's just evil it's a hate crime so there's this truth and lie again my my theme here this recurring theme in this movie of truth and lies smashing up against each other and and, and doing so in a very crude way There are decent people here, he says. And that's the ironic thing because none of these people is decent, right? Because he only about 20 minutes ago or a half hour ago was complaining to Thelma Ritter there that he's fed up of babysitting his own son's child. <laughs> so there's nothing decent about him or any of them. And it's this ironic monstrous refrain against the kind of evil that you are seeing here right before your eyes this level of menace started with trying to set the well setting a light the shoe of a sleeping man presumably homeless then it's escalated to that really humiliating quite frankly rape um I mean, borderline. I mean, it's certainly a sexual assault. And I hate to collapse those two things together because, but it, but it is, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an attack on him. And you see that happen. And now it's escalated to, you're now attacking these two older people. And there's a defiance about, about them, about him. And then they crush the cross cut to this other couple and, are that is that couple going to be them in in a few years time you know in a years from now masculinity again rushes up against things toxic and otherwise and you see it again here the guy who was setting upon this woman and he was literally trying to rape this woman that he's on a date with and now he's become silly putty in the hands of this alpha male male toxic masculinity terrorist and look what he's doing he's humiliating this woman and invading her space and the guy who was setting upon her who was you know about 25 minutes ago trying to rape her let's be honest is now all of a sudden not doing anything to stop what we see going on here. I mean, this guy is practically terrorizing her. He is terrorizing her. It's not even practical. And again, the claustrophobia in this shot of the three of them here. He's now going to have them to drink, try to drink from the same bottle he's drinking from. And look, it's like this bizarre, evil menage a trois just to get in the mood and she's terrified she's terrified and he doesn't have the guts to stand up and punch him one in the face and look how look how frightened he is he's apt, either frightened or completely submissive to it it's as if he wants it to happen on a subconscious level that's what's so terrifying and this woman is in the middle of this and neither of these men is doing anything to make her life and her existence in this moment any easier. Certainly, the male companion who literally tried to rape her half an hour ago. This is really humiliating again, you know. They are completely talking past this particular woman. 
What is she like in the sack? I mean, that's just the direct violation. And he even has the temerity to even respond. I mean, he, this woman's agency now is so crushed and her boyfriend or her date has completely betrayed her in this moment. And he even responds by saying, oh, she's all right. I mean, how can you do that? It's like Ted Cruz, who did not stand by his wife when you know who was humiliating her. And he instead joined up with the guy who humiliated his wife. And I know he made a statement about, oh, you can't come after my Heidi. But that's exactly what the guy did. And Ted Cruz ended up joining him against his own wife. How disgusting. That that meant more to him than his own wife. His, uh, the woman that he loves meant less to him than the guy who insulted the woman that he loves. I'll know what to do with you. Again, that's a challenge to the masculinity or the, the manhood, literally and otherwise and figuratively, of the man who has been trying to rape the woman that he's with. I mean, it shows you who's more evil here. I mean, that's another question that this film ultimately asks is who are the bad guys in this movie? The bad guys meaning people, men, women, people. Who are they? And she's just completely just had it. There's that poster in the background. Look, she's completely been betrayed. It's as if she's been raped again by him again, plus Tony Masanti's character. I want to stay and see this, said Brock Peters. I want to watch. I want to watch. This is that whole voyeurism thing, you know? They're in Harlem now, 125th Street, and um, you see that. Look at him, he's completely staggered. I mean, this is really something. And you never see him from the waist down. You know, there are women in the movie that are shot from the waist down, but you can see, you know, the legs of, again, uh, Jan Sterling here. And it's interesting the way that the camera captures this. Um, and all the vices that these people have. And you've got these two uber terrorists who are exposing them for who they really are. And that's the thing, you know, when I say the incident, which incident? Because there are many incidents. And I think that's the point of the movie, among many other points, is that this movie is about all of these people. It's not about the two people who are doing all the terrorizing. It's about the other 14 people who are doing all the watching and the voyeurism. And they're all excited. At least Brock Peters says, hey, I, I want to watch. This curiosity, you know, watching the car wreck on the highway, you know, you slow your car down to see it because you almost, it's as if you want to see a dead body, a bloody body. And you now got Bo Bridges here taking charge and now, but, but it's kind of this generic talk. Hey, why are you, uh, why don't you guys knock it off? You know, you've had your fun. Yeah, and so now the dialogue begins. And there's this whole other dynamic, right? One, you know, Bo Bridges says he's from Oklahoma, and these two guys uh, who are doing all the terrorizing and the violence are clearly New Yorkers. So there's that New York, Oklahoma thing going on. And by the way, what's also interesting, as a point of another background point, um, Mickey Mantle at the time was with the New York Yankees in the 60s. And I believe in the 50s as well. And I think he had left the Yankees um, not too long after or before 1967. Or he may still, I don't know, I don't remember. But I do remember that in 1961, uh, Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle, um, and Mantle was from Oklahoma, had the home run chase. And, and everybody wanted Mantle to win. And he didn't. It was Roger Maris who did. And they were both on the same team. And they... they um, were vying for the home run title that season. Maris has 61 home runs. 
the mantle had in it something in his 50s I believe it was and it's just interesting on a New York City subway train in 1967 when this was filmed or 66 um, and then it was released in 67 but interesting that uh, Bo Bridges character comes from Oklahoma I think there's something about that that I don't know if the director took that into account but I find it interesting This is the first time that they teach you how to be tough in the army. Again, this, 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 again, we are constantly visiting masculinity issues. Issues of masculinity, toxic masculinity, stereotypical masculinity, passive masculinity, um, possible emasculation or not. And we're seeing it here, though the military, in the Navy, you know, that whole thing, you know, uh, village people stuff, right? And, and the village people were known as these kind of um, village friendly slash um, if you will gay slash macho man posturing kind of identity that went on in the 60s and 70s and this you know and it's just again the racism and the hatred there's that too you've got Bo Bridges as this toxic you know it's well it comes from an industry that's toxic right military and all the attacks on women that the US military boys military men they're not boys rapists exact upon female military members um, all of the Latinos who have been killed including the Latina Vanessa Guillen killed on at Fort Hood or in and around that base um, in 2020 and in that moment you see here the, this this kind of toxic masculinity in that moment um, the real close-up of these two and then these dueling masculinities fighting and then Bo Bridges before that saying to the black man Brock Peters son I'll accommodate you son I'd like to accommodate you and so there's that moment of racism too that hatred racist that comes out of Bo Bridges character so all of these people have vices right they're all have got evil in them each of them has gradations of it and here's the first little standoff and it's we're right up in the face of Bo Bridges and this is the first real challenge to the masculinity of Tony Musante you see he doesn't know what to do with that there's a half and look how close up that was you saw the close up of Tony Musante and there's this he looks like he doesn't know what to do with it, right? And and he and they're all and again, Bo Bridges is overing with this, right? He's joining Masanti in this attack on what we're gonna see in a few moments, this attack on Ruby D and Brock Peters, which is coming. We can't get off the train, it's too obvious. Well, Edmund Mann has done everything to put them in this danger. You know, he didn't get the cab, uh, you know, and now look what's happening. And there's that poster again. They're trying to get him off this train, you know, and they're trying to get out off the train at the same time and that's not working because he's blocking the entrance. 110th Street, so, you know, they're gonna be going back downtown. And there's this smile on the face of Jan Sterling there. You know, again, there's this fight back by Thelma Ritter's character. And they're all sitting there in abject horror. They're trying to get off this train and we're all thrust into this and it's just so macabre and it's vicious, it's menacing. He's trying to pull the emergency brake and boom, you know, he's squeezing his hand and crushing his hand. And then Thelma Ritter just slaps him. And she's braver than everybody. She's fighting, you know, she's fighting. You know, she's absolutely challenging him. And now he's stalking around. It, it's just... That this kind of... He's got his shirt open like he thinks he's some sex god or something or I don't know what but he really thinks he's got this swagger going but I think he's a Tony Masanti's character is very pathetic 
he's menacing and sort of savage, but he and he it's an excellent performance, but he's also a very pathetic figure. He's a boy who just uh, is toxic. He he's got this toxic masculinity, and he's violent. He's extremely violent. And there's nothing about him that I think is redeeming at all. It's interesting, most of the time you don't see Martin Sheen doing a whole lot of much except for that assault and attack on the gay man. Martin Sheen is actually pretty much a spectator in this in this whole thing. I just think it's incredible that none of them, but it's not surprising, but this is the bystander theory. And you know, the camera, he runs straight into the camera. And it's interesting, here we go, you know? Um, nobody said anything, but here's Brock Peters being a bad guy too. And here's the challenge to Brock Peters. I'm with you, Jack. And Masanti's like, are you with me? What are you talking about? Ruby D knows what's happening here before Brock Peters does. He's saying, you want to knock some heads together? Go ahead, it's okay with me. This is what Brock Peters is telling him. He's quite content to see white passengers get their butts kicked until Tony Masanti lets him know where he stands with Brock Peters. And we get to see that right now in these close-ups and the acting here is razor sharp by Ruby D and Brock Peters. And here we go, we get to see the, and the smile will soon disappear off the face with the racism coming out of the mouth, the racist attitude out of the mouth of Tony Masanti's character. And it's the truth, right? The truth and the lie. The truth is, is that, yeah, Brock Peters um, is quite happy to watch white passengers get beaten up by white people, this so-called white and white violence. But he, the lie is, is that he's with him. Oh, I'm with you, Jack. And he's not. He's not. This is a white man in a white racist world, uh, 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 an oppressive white system of whiteness that oppresses and condemns and criminalizes and brutalizes and murders black people. And, and Brock Peters has, in his own naivete, even as a black man who's been shouting all of these things earlier, is getting a comeuppance here to think that he and this white guy could ever be on a level playing field in a racist country. And now it's full throttle, right? Tony Masanti is now throwing all of the racism and the racist names at him. And he's absolutely forcing Brock Peters to, to go beat the hell out of him. And, and this is just evil. Right, this is really evil here. It's one of the most jarring moments of this movie because now you're really reenacting enslavement right here in this car. You don't have to have the chains. It's right there. You see? Look what he look at what Sheen is doing there to Ruby D while he's humiliating Brock Peters. Masanti's humiliating him. And any false move here means that Ruby D could either be raped or severely injured with a broken arm or something. And all the while you've got Ruby D pacifying him again. And it's the story of the black man and the black woman in America and the relationship that they have, right? That's so uh, fraught with a lot of complexity and a lot of baggage because of enslavement and the way that black masculinity gets compromised here righteous masculinity gets compromised here by a white man and a white system and even this black woman who is his you know his wife or companion and lover they're together right but even she has to rescue him from it by doing something that's very passive and pacifying 
to those white men, but really kind of puts her own man in check, right? Because maybe another woman, black woman, would have said, go for it. But her life was in danger too. And then she, for the second time, with a white man who's insulting her husband, has to be the one to be peacemaker because we know that in any given moment, Brock Peter's life could be ended, right? And we know that in America. Everybody watches this, but doesn't watch it because they know the truth. Everybody white in that car is an accomplice to that moment. Everybody. And they don't stand up and say anything when Masanti's using that word over and over and over to Brock Peter's character. He says, you know, and this and that. And look, he feels mighty strong now, doesn't he? He's put down a black man, right? And now he's puffing out his chest. And look at the desire in her eyes. She, she desires him. And she stands up and drops her pocketbook. It's as if she's been seduced by him. This is Jan Sterling. This piece of acting is really powerful. And there's a lot of erotic charge in the air here. And his chest is open. And there's something about this scene that's really ambiguous. And it's played a little bit like the straw dog scene, except it's, it, I think there's a more honest representation here because that scene in Straw Dogs is just not honest. It's this male misogynistic fantasy about rape. It's this rape fantasy from men. But this here is more nuanced given what we know about these characters in this shot, right? He undresses this man, tosses his hat away because he's really not much of a man, right? And that's what Jan Sterling has been saying all along, right? this unmasking of this man. And she is just, she's drawn to Tony Masanti. She literally wants him. This is what is really powerful in this movie as well. She's charged up by him because he's got this uber toxic masculinity, but she's drawn to it. And there are women who real, in real life who are drawn to that, right? They are drawn to a man who breaks all the rules. There are a lot of women who like Donald Trump, and I think a lot of white women who do, and I think there's some of that for them that they like, and the reason some of them voted for him twice is, you know, I think they were drawn to this kind of sadistic, violent, contemptuous stuff that turned them on. You know, there's a, that's twisted as far as I'm concerned, but there are women like that in the world. Ah, oh, she sticks out her tongue. There you go. She wants him. She clearly wants him, but she's, she's trying to snap herself out of it. And this guy here, her husband, is such a cuckold. And he's trying to fight back, but he is so weak. She's about to let, she's about to be seduced, literally. I think I should just let this scene play out here. I'm going to. That's the explosion. She's not angry at them. She's angry at her husband again. This is the recurring theme, right? The truth and the lie. They're men, you're nothing, right? She actually applauds them at that moment. I'd rather have them than you. And that's the truth, right? You're nothing, you're not a man. She just goes off at her own husband in front of all of them. And she slaps him. And then he slaps her. So there's this act of male violence against her from her own husband. See? And look at him. He doesn't know what he's done. But he knows what he's done. And the thing is, that's the truth, right? Is The truth is, is that she finds those two men to be incredibly sexually attractive because she loves how they break the rules. No matter how savage they are. And the movie has dressed her up this way. And I do not think that there's dishonesty there. 
I think there's a subconscious truth. She has, at the beginning of the movie, when we first see her, right, she has said that you should invite, remember the guy's name, I forget now, you should invite that guy over sometime with us. So there's this allusion, as I said earlier, to a, a menage a trois. And I'm telling you, um, that explodes itself in this return moment where she's allowing that guy to touch her. I mean, obviously, it's not so much her allowing it as them, you know, trying to seduce her. And, and, and I'm, I would say rape her eventually. And she's, al she's let, you know, she's standing there and part of her wants it. Because the husband that she has is a cuckold. He's absolutely, he's ineffectual. He's feckless. He's weak. He's, you know, he's not any kind of man. She's been living a lie. And as contemptuous and evil as these two men are and violent as they are, at least in her eyes, she finds something about them that's attractive and dangerous. And she's attracted to the danger in these two men. And so she's on the verge of literally wanting wanting both of them and that's the opposite side of what she you know that's really the subconscious that she expressed to her husband near the beginning right that oh you should invite him over sometime you know this menage a trois the swinger thing and i think she really wants that and you saw her stick her tongue out and that was this lustful lascivious type of overture she's making to him i mean she wants him if he's not in that car in front of all these people I dare say that she probably would have gone to bed with him. And that's the truth, right? That's the stark truth of that moment. And I do think there's some honesty in it, even though, yes, it has got this misogynistic frame in it. But I do think that is very true. There are some women who are attracted to these violent figures. You know, it's kind of like some of the women who marry people on death row. And I'm talking about people who aren't necessarily innocent on death row either, who have killed women, you know, or have killed men, or have killed children or molested them, and they marry them before they get executed. You know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's real. That stuff is real. There, there's a small percentage of women who really do go for this type of so-called bad boy. But now, you know, they're in the jungle now. Come and put me down. Bo Bridges now has seen enough. And there's a man in a sling, right? And now they're ready to go. Finally, somebody is ready to take this guy on. And look, he stuck his tongue out there too briefly. Did you see that? Let's see what they taught you in the military. And he knows he's in trouble here once that knife comes out. And now we're really going to see some stuff here. So now this confrontation. And he's been hit at least twice. In fact, three times right there. Uh, this moment now. He's been stiffed. He's been hit. And now Bo Bridges is still fighting him with a deep stab wound in his stomach, in his torso, you know? And, and uh, he's picked something up here. I don't know what that is, but he's absolutely going to town on him. And there's this vengeance now, right? And the camera angle, and they're all looking at her. And they're kind of cringing, but they're also looking. He is now slayed this dragon and he's coming after the other guy so he's killed this guy right and now he's coming after the martin sheen character and martin sheen's character is like oh no i'm uh i went out of here and this is the truth right this is the truth martin sheen's character is really an actor right and we can see he's exposed he's a wimp and literally, he knees him in the balls there, Bo Bridges. And he throws his army buddy down too, because 
this guy's going to probably bleed out and die here. <laughs> it's remarkable, right? Because even in that moment, his buddy, his army buddy, has not helped him. Where were you, buddy? Is what Bo Bridges is saying to his buddy, who says, oh, it happened so fast. Yeah, right. Sure. It's been happening for, what, 45 minutes now, friend. And you never lifted a finger once. And he knows that his life is almost over here. You know? He knows that uh, that he is his last few minutes of life. Bloodstained shirt. He says, I'll be all right. Now they're all finally... I mean, you've got this guy saying, oh, there's... Nothing, there's something I can do. Oh, yeah, there's plenty you could do. Well, it's a bit late for that now. But I just don't have time to explain it to you right now. That I, I got to say, that's the most honest thing. And here come the cops. And look who they go for. Yep, they arrest the black man. There you go. That is the truth right there. That's the truth, right? The police jump on the black man in the corner, minding his own business. And, of course, that has not changed from 1967. And they have to tell those cops, no, 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 it's not him. It's not the black man. It's over here. Martin Sheen has been playing a role. That's what I think. Of course, uh, your interpretation would be welcome as well about Martin Sheen's character in this. I find him to be a most interesting character. All of these people are, but they're all guilty. They have been sitting there for at least 45 minutes and they've done absolutely nothing except for Bo Bridges' character who is probably going to pay for it with his life now. And, they, and he's looking at all of them, you know, like, what are, where, what are you doing? You know, what did you do? And he was the only one that stood up really and physically challenged uh, Tony Masanti and ended it and killed him, you know, in an act of self-defense, really, uh, um, for the sake of these passengers, certainly not for himself. And look at them all, heads bowed in shame. It's an indictment of that car. And every last head is bowed. Larry Pierce directs the heck out of this moment. Every head is bowed right down to the bum on the... Uh, <laughs> And he falls over from the seat onto the floor, you know, and then they kind of, one of them or two of them briefly look up. It's a moment that is really well directed. And watch them, they just kind of walk past him, walk over him as the car comes to a stop. Business as usual. See that? They just walk past them. They are, they are the real villains of the piece here. Look, look at this. They simply just walk over him. They don't offer him any help. They still look down on the, the bum, right? They don't, after everything that's happened, you know, they didn't intervene anywhere. And look at this. No, no one's going to help. They just walk over him. <laughs> it's just, she picked something up there. I don't know what that is. I can't see it. It goes by too quickly, but as she walks out and then you see this post that says boy on it, right? That could be a racist thing. Don't drop, drop out of school. Now they'll call you that all your life. I mean, it's like a subconscious message, right? And then look, the bum. Maybe he's the most honorable person in the entire movie. And I would guess that he is. Look at these actors. Extraordinary performances by all of them. What a film. It's a harrowing movie. It's a powerful movie. Um, it's a movie that makes you think and it makes you uncomfortable and it is it's definitely misogynist in many ways and there's also some truth in this movie too powerful movie i want to thank you very much for your time and for joining me for this audio commentary i'm omar moore you can find me on twitter at the popcorn r e e l